current my current top 40 obsession. Hi. <laughs> so I uh, purposely took a long time to get here. Don't worry, because I wanted you guys to have as much time to listen to that song as possible. So I did it for you. I wasn't just slow. Um, hi, I'm Shanti. I'm on staff with Crew. It is year three of being on staff. I'm excited to be with you guys tonight. Um, being on staff rocks. I get paid to come to Prime Time. So we are in week number two of a series, a four-week series on the book, 1 Thessalonians. And so we are going to look at uh, the second part of this book today. Last week, if you guys were here, James walked us through the first chapter. So we talked about the spiritual movement that was growing in the city called Thessalonica. And James talked to us about faith, hope, and love, right? These kind of three major components of spiritual movement. So we got a lot of work to do tonight, you guys. We got we got, we got some good stuff to go through. But first, I wanted to ask, you know, since we're, like, going through the Bible, I thought it'd be cool if we, like, had Bibles. Right? Woo! Yes. Yeah. Thank you, one person who's excited over here. Um, okay, so we got lots of Bibles, New Testaments, um, that we're handing out, like, candy, like giving candy to a baby instead of taking candy from a baby. Go ahead and read 
with us, and you can follow along in your trying new Bibles. So Paul writes, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We work day and night that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out, and displeased God, and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles, that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, so Paul's going to talk about how they had to leave Thessalonica. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus that is coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith, that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you, you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it had, has come to pass, and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you, and your labor would be in vain. Ooh, how'd you do? So this is a really big chunk of scripture, um, but really we're only going like, to kind of tackle and camp out on a part of it tonight, so don't, don't freak out yet, um, don't worry. At first glance, kind of big picture, what just happened, right? We got some of the historical context, Paul is saying why he's writing, he's talking about leaving and sending Timothy and hearing about them. But what's Paul doing? I mean, in this whole first section, Paul is telling the Thessalonians, he's reminding them of his time with them. He's like, you know this, you remember this, and he's defending himself. And so, okay, why would Paul do that? Remember that Paul got run out of town, right? Paul got totally got run out of town. And it's pretty probable that the same people that ran these Christian missionaries out of town were the same people who were slandering them now. So Paul and Silas are hearing reports from Timothy of what's going on in Thessalonica. And basically, like, Paul is writing to, like, defend himself against people who are smack talking him, is essentially what it comes down to here. So if you look at verse 5, he's like, okay, you guys, you guys remember what actually went down, right? Like, we didn't just tell you nice things that you wanted to hear. We didn't try to steal from you. We loved you. So don't get tricked by these people who are basically trying to undermine what it is that we did. Remember the time that we had together and what it is that you learned from us. So that's kind of the big picture of what's going on here, what Paul is doing. He's defending his ministry. But what I want us to do tonight is actually to go from there and to spend the rest of our time uh, looking at Paul's actual description of his ministry with the Thessalonians. Because in this passage of scripture, we actually get one of the clearest examples, one of the clearest outlines that we have in the Bible of Ministry of especially this thing that we're, we call discipleship. So we're going to start up in verse 4. So it's up on the screen now, but you can look in your Bible. So verse 4, Paul wrote that we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. 
So this here, this verse, this is Paul's mission. He's entrusted with the gospel. And to be entrusted basically means to assign the care of something to someone, or it's to give someone the responsibility for something. So Paul knew that he had been entrusted with a task. He knew that he had something to do. He wasn't just like haphazardly kind of like traipsing around the ancient Near East, like flooding from town to town, right? He, he was using his time strategically in light of the task that he had been given. And how do we know this is Paul's mission? Well, it's the same mission that Jesus had. Jesus said, if we look back in the Gospels, Jesus said that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He said that in Luke 19.10. So that was Jesus' declared mission. When Jesus first came into the public sphere, one of the very first things that he did was to raise up some men to follow him. Jesus would spend time assembling key people around him with whom he would spend his three years of public ministry. And he would spend time with them. He would teach them. He would train them. So that one day they would be ready for the time when he would be crucified, he would rise from the dead, and that he would issue them a command. Because Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the very end of the age. As Jesus is about to leave earth, right, he's crucified, he was crucified, he rose from the dead, he issued his followers' command, and he's about to leave earth, he was asking his followers to continue his mission in the world, to make disciples of all nations. And all nations is not like fancy Greek for something else, it's like fancy Greek for all nations, just like the whole world, right? That's a, that's a really big mission. It's a really big scope. So Jesus wants his followers to pick up where he has left off and to help the whole world believe in him. And again, that's huge, but in the very same breath, Jesus has actually given us the key to how to fulfill that. And the key is making disciples. Make disciples of all nations. People. People are the key. People are the key to reaching the world, and they are at the very heartbeat of God. Jesus didn't just ask his uh, followers to make converts. I don't know if you guys ever thought about that. But he never asked them to make converts. He asked them to go and make disciples. So men and women who would follow Jesus and who would look more and more like him in their character and also in how they influence the world. That's how the whole world was going to hear about the good news of Christ. People investing in people making disciples. Okay, so now we're going to skip back over. We're going to land back in 1 Thessalonians. And we're back to Paul. So this is what Paul is doing. right? Paul knew that this was his task, to make disciples of all nations. So we're going to keep reading, and we're going to see how Paul actually went about fulfilling this mission. So verse 7, here we go. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. 